Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We literally, and I don't mean it to sound negative at all, but we kind of live in a war zone. There's wars in the earth. <laughs> Everywhere you go today, there's battles, 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 battles. Wars in the government. Wars in third world nations. Wars all over the place. There's warfare in our mind. Our spirit knows what's right, but the enemy will try to come against our mind. Has anybody had any warfare against your mind even just today? Well, so do I. And the interesting thing about it is you never know exactly what day it's going to hit you or how bad it might be. For some reason yesterday, I just had a bunch of weirdness going on in my head. It was like, I mean, I saw everything that was wrong with everybody. You ever have days like that? It's like all day I'm fighting. I'm not a fault finder. 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 <laughs> I notice things. I wish I didn't notice so much. But I have to have that to do what I'm doing. So I really don't wish I didn't notice so much, but I wish it could be selective noticing. <laughs> so I can only notice everything that everybody does right. Oh, some days you just have these thoughts. I just can't do the same old. And the devil's thinking, whoopee. <laughs> you never know exactly. Now today, everything's much better, you know? I had a real stupid headache yesterday. Today, it's gone. Yesterday, I had all kinds of drainage in my throat. Today, it's gone. <laughs> But here's the thing. I acted just as nice yesterday as I am today. Today, it's just a little easier. We don't get a pass because we don't feel good. That's why we have God's power. <laughs> oh, this is so good for you guys. <laughs> And even if you don't need it, I'll preach to myself. I'm happy to preach to myself anytime. <laughs> And we have wars in the spirit. Wow. You know, there's this earth that we see. And then we hear heaven talked about, but there's all kinds of atmospheric space between there and here, and that's where these evil spirits dwell. And although we don't see demons, and you know, sometimes when you think about the devil and demons, you conjure up these pictures of all these weird things you see on TV or whatever. Well, you know, I don't even want you to think like that. What I want you to do is recognize the influence of the enemy. Don't be going around trying to find a demon everywhere and cast him out. Recognize the influences of demonic work. Amen? When I complain, it's not God. When I'm tempted to be selfish, it's not God. When I get mad and I refuse to forgive, it's not God. When I give away the best that I have because I feel like God's leading me to, even though I don't want to, it's God. When I go ahead and keep my commitment to somebody, even though I'm hurting so bad, I feel like I'm going to die, that's God. You know, you guys are so much smarter than what you might think you are. I mean, I could give you a what's God and what's the devil test, and every one of you would pass. You would. You know. We know. We're not dumb. We know. Because we have the mind of Christ. The only thing we need is action. <laughs> and to be vigilant. And actually, to tell you the truth, although it, you know, your flesh might be saying, this just sounds a little bit like a lot of hard work. But your spirit, if you pay attention to what's going on in your spirit right now, you feel an excitement, a life, an enthusiasm in you because nobody wants to wa be walked all over all the time. 
Nobody wants the enemy to take advantage of them and rule them. We're built by God to rule and reign. You will reign as kings in life through Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Reign and rule as kings in life through Jesus Christ. When Adam was put in the garden, God told him to manage it, to take care of it. It was his domain. You're in authority here. We know about 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 that says the mind is attacked with reasonings and theories and all kinds of wrong thoughts. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. We have weapons. This is a weapon. You know, I don't think I ever walk out here without this in my hand. Even if I'm not going to use it. Even if I'm not going to look up something or I'm doing something in the service that I don't need it for, I carry it because I think it's a threat to the enemy. <laughs> Just by me carrying it around, I'm saying I depend on this. My life is in this. This is my life. You need to value your Bible. I think there's a benefit in just carrying it around, especially if you really believe what's in it. So the Word of God is a weapon. Praise and thanksgiving is a weapon. There's nothing that irritates the enemy anymore when he's coming against you and you just sit down and open your mouth and give thanks for everything you can think of. That's a way to do warfare. We have weapons. We need to use them. But we have to know the truth in order to do that. Now let's look at Luke chapter 4. This whole battle that went on between Jesus and Satan is so valuable for us to read this. Okay. Then Jesus, full of and controlled, verse 1. Then Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, I could camp there. Full of and controlled. So many people want to be filled with the Spirit, but they don't want to be controlled by the Spirit. Anyway, don't have time for that. <laughs> Returned from the Jordan <clears throat> and was led in by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. Well, thank you, Holy Spirit. I mean, come on, God, I thought you loved me. I thought I was headed for the promised land. But you know what? When you come out of Egypt, which is turning your back on sin and accepting the life of Christ, you head for the promised land, but we all have to take a trip through the wilderness. And the wilderness is that living in the soul. We have to learn to live in the spirit and not live in the soul. And so the Holy Spirit led him into a difficult time where he would have to square off with the devil. And you know why? Because I think it had to be clearly established that he knew who he was. It had to be clearly established that he knew who he was. And you'll see by the time this battle's over, then Jesus began his public ministry with signs and wonders and power. Goliath, David had to face and square off with Goliath before, it was one of the things he had to go through before he could wear the crown. He was anointed to be king 20 years before he wore the crown. One of the things he had to do was square off with Goliath. Another thing he had to do was go through all his testing with being mistreated by Saul. <laughs> Come on now while he waited in faith for God's deliverance. That's another four-part series. And during those days, he ate nothing, and he was hungry. And verse 3 says, Then the devil said to him, 
You ever notice that sometimes the devil waits till you're down? I don't know about you, but he talks to me more when I'm really tired than when I'm not. Then the devil said to him, if you, if you are, if you are the son of God, and I love that because he was attacking his identity. <laughs> well, if God loves you, then why do you have this problem? Well, if you're saved, then why do you act this way? We need to know how to come back and say, I belong to God, I'm none of your business. Amen. Amen. I belong to God, I am none of your business. <laughs> if you are the son of God, then order this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. <laughs> And Jesus replied to him, it is written. It's the only answer you ever need to give the enemy. It is written. Man shall not live and be sustained by and on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the habitable world in a moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye. And he said to him, now watch this, to you, I will give all this power and authority. He already had power and authority. Yeah. And their glory, all their magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, and grace. Now watch this. For it has been turned over to me, and I will give it to whomever I will. Who turned it over to him? Adam. But little did he know he was squaring off with the only person that could ever take it back. Boy, so much happened in that wilderness in those 40 days. Verse 7, therefore, if you will do homage to and worship me just once. I love the just once lie. Oh, come on. It's just once and everybody else at work does it. Come on now. I mean, come on. It's, you know. It's just a little sin. You know what a compromise is? It means to go just a little bit below what you know is right. Little bit. The little bit lie. The just once lie. If you'll just bow down to me just that once. Well, that once was all it would have taken. And we wouldn't be here today. Think about the price that would have been paid if he would have bowed down to the just one sly. And Jesus replied, I love it, get behind me, Satan. There you go. Come on, you can do this just once. I mean, everybody else does it. Get behind me, Satan. He opened his mouth and he put the enemy in his place. Ooh, buddy. <laughs> it is written, you shall do homage to and worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Verse 9, then, you notice he doesn't give up easy. Then he took him to Jerusalem and set him on a gable of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, another attack on identity. That's a big one with the enemy. If you are the son of God, Cast yourself down from here, for it is written, now the devil's quoting scripture to him. He's like, okay, you want to play that game? I know some of that stuff too. You know, the enemy can quote scripture to you out of context at the wrong time. For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you to guard and watch over you closely and carefully, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, the scripture says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay, verse 13. It's important to see this. And when the devil had ended every, the complete cycle of temptation, you have to understand that sometimes these trials and temptations and troubles come in cycles. It's like a train. You know, there's many cars to it. 
And you got to stand firm for more than five minutes or an hour. When he had completed the cycle of temptation, now, now this is not good news, but you got to see this. He temporarily left him. <laughs> that is, stood off from him until another more opportune and favorable time. <laughs> oh, really? I thought we had this finished. <laughs> See, he's always watching for an opportunity. We have to get smart enough to not keep giving him open doors. Come on now. We have to get smart enough to stop giving him open doors. Now, you know, it's up to you what you want to do with this message. It's totally up to you. You can continue to be wimpy and head of and pathetic, and I can't, it's too much, and somebody needs to fix this, and somebody needs to do this. Or you can say, look, I know who I am in Christ. I've been informed. I have power. I have authority. I'm going to take responsibility for my life, and I am going to be what God wants me to be, do what He wants me to do, and have what He wants me to have. Amen. And you don't have to become devil-minded. Whatever you do, don't think and talk about the devil all the time. Just know that you have authority over him. Learn to recognize his fruit and resist him at the onset. Man, if every believer could hear this about two days after they're saved. Now, I'm going to sit here and have a little chat with you. It's one of my motherly chats, okay? I sit down for these. <sighs> now, I have had something on my heart and I'm going to be doing more teaching on this, but I'm going to try it out on you. Um, of course, me as a teacher, I'm very disturbed by the lack of victory that I see in Christians' lives overall. Now, that doesn't mean that nobody has victory. I mean, I'm sure there's very wonderful, strong, victorious people in this room and watching by TV. But by and large, we're not impressing the world. When I say we, I mean the church of Christ, Christianity, is we should be taking the world by storm. I mean, everybody should be like, my gosh, these people are different, you know. Back in the Old Testament, there was such power on the Israelites at certain times where they were walking in agreement with God that all the other nations were petrified of them. And a lot of Christians who don't have any real victory go to church. They read their Bible. They give in offerings. And so I started searching for answers. And I want to tell you, and please hear me, there's a big difference in reading your Bible and studying the Word of God. Now, I think right here is where there's a big breakdown. And I also think that many people read the Word out of obligation because they kind of think God will be a little bit ticked off if they don't. Put your time in. How many years did I read my chapter a day? I couldn't have told you five minutes after I read it what it said. But I felt nice because I read it. And then I got on one of these read the Bible through in a year programs. And I mean, that's, that's a great goal. I'm not saying don't have it, but my motivation was all wrong. I was just trying to conquer something so I could say with everybody else in the group, I'm reading the Bible through in a year. I didn't go to it to learn anything. I just went to it for, not even for quality, but for quantity. <laughs> Had to read six chapters a day to keep up and get it all done in a year, and that's all I cared about was getting the six chapters done. One day the Holy Ghost said to me when I was done, so what'd you learn? And I'll never forget what God put on my heart. I would rather you read one verse and meditate on it till you get something out of it. 
So don't ever approach the word for quantity. Always approach it for quality. When you pick this up to read it, now I'm getting ready to say something that you need. Don't ever open it to read it unless you intend to obey it. Now, I, you can trust me. I've been doing this a long time, and I know that I know that I know that I know that I'm hearing from God on this. People, not all people, but many people, they're not approaching the Word of God for what it is. Let me tell you, there's life in here. This is a weapon against the enemy. This has the power to renew your mind, to change your life, to heal your brokenness. There's no question that you have that's not answered in this amazing book. There's no problem you have that you cannot find the answer for in here. In here you find the love that you want. You find the acceptance that you want. You find right standing with God. You find privileges and rights and promises and power and blessing. But there's one thing that we don't talk about enough. God does say, you got to do what I say. <laughs> and I see you ain't even clapping about that. Yes, there's grace, and we get nothing without the grace of God. Everything that we get is by the grace of God. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a part. <laughs> you see, I don't just, I mean, I know who I am in Christ now. I know. And I mean, I was so guilty and condemned and had so much shame and felt so bad about myself for so many years, even as a Christian. Well, Joyce, how did you get over it? Studying studying, writing out in longhand every scripture in the Bible about righteousness, about no condemnation, about being delivered from shame, looking up words in the dictionary, looking up words in the Vines Concordance, studying, studying, reading books, listening to CDs, confessing that I was the righteousness of God in Christ. You say, how long did it take? A few years, but I got it. I got it. And now, the devil cannot do that to me anymore because it's not just up here, it's in me. And I wish that I could unzip you and just cram this in you and zip you back up. But I have to be honest with you and tell you that I cannot. <laughs> you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. And I'm just telling you, as plain and simple as I know how to, and people are going to be hearing this from me for a while, make time to study. We're actually going to be issuing a challenge from our ministry for people to go on a 30-day fast with us. And what the fast is going to amount to is just agreeing to set aside 30 minutes a day to study. Surely we can handle that. If you're already studying, then 30 extra minutes a day. And if you're not studying at all, then just start with 30 minutes a day. Well, I'm just so busy. Well, cut something out of your overwhelming, miserable life. <laughs> Don't make me come down there and get you. If you have a lunch or at work, Take half of it and study. If you're really going to get radical, take the other half and pray. You could probably do with missing a meal anyway. Or eat real fast and then spend the rest of your time. Let me tell you something. Now look at me. We find the time to do what we really want to do. We find the time to do what we really want to do. You know the best way to get the most value out of something like this, or even when you watch me on TV? And maybe you're not always in a position where you can take notes, but if you can, 
even just write down the reference of the scriptures that I share, then later get your Bible out and go back, pray, Holy Spirit, teach me. I am your teacher, but I am not the teacher. And I'm not doing my job right if I don't lead you to him. So you take what I have taught you, then you go to the teacher, the Holy Spirit, and say, now help me get this into my life. Show me how I can do this. You know, we really do need to remind ourselves daily that we have power and authority in Christ to overcome situations in life.